invite you to take your Bibles this morning and turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22. Luke, chapter 22. That song that we have just sung kind of took us right to the cross in that moment and, and uh, be able to think about some of the um, emotions that went along with that. And it is, um, it is, it's exactly what we want to do here is uh, we're going to look at a moment just before the cross and be able to uh, observe a few things about a pretty intense um, moment of emotion for our Savior. And, um, and I trust that it will be an encouragement to our heart, even though there will be some uh, some pain and agony that we see expressed here. And uh, I, I'm just, uh, let me just be vulnerable for a moment and say that I, I feel totally inadequate to, to talk about what we are going to talk about. And uh, uh, for, for a number of reasons, uh, I wasn't there. Uh, we're reading the a record of uh, the trustworthy record inspired by the Holy Spirit, and so we we get to peer into this moment. I wasn't there, but I also think that in our our life of comfort and ease, that it is easy for us to miss the intensity of this moment, and. Uh, and so it's a sobering moment for, for me personally as I observe these verses that we're going to look at. And I trust that it will be a sobering moment for you, but also a moment of joy. We, we touched on these two thoughts in, in Sunday school, you know, that um, as serious as uh, various aspects of the crucifixion are, it brings joy to our hearts. And so we, we hold those two things in tension, uh, yeah, in constant tension that there is reason for joy and there is reason for sorrow when we think of what Christ experienced, when we think of what we uh, uh, in our sin have done to contribute to Christ's death. And uh, we, we look at all of those things and, and we, we hold those two truths and, and we're in the middle of that. Do you ever feel that at communion when we celebrate the Lord's uh, death? at that moment and come together well it's it's serious it's we're, we're often pretty quiet and take time for personal reflection but yet we are so joyful because uh, of the salvation that is ours in Christ so there's a bit of that I think uh, mingled in with what we're going to look at this morning let's bow together for prayer shall we heavenly father as we come to your word uh, we invite you to be our teacher that you, uh, through the Holy Spirit, would, would uh, cause us to see and to understand a truth from your word. And I pray that you would guide us in these moments, that we, would, that we would enjoy and celebrate what we observe at the same time as we grieve and are filled with sorrow over what we observe. And so we just commit this, uh, these moments to you, uh, we are so thankful for the Word of God, uh, for the truth, the authority uh, of the Word, for the uh, sufficiency of the Word, and we seek to submit ourselves to you uh, at this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. And so the cross was near at this particular moment. Uh, we read earlier about, uh, in, our, in our scripture reading time, what re is referred to as the triumphal entry. Today being Palm Sunday, we are mindful of that final week of our Savior as he approached the cross. And uh, a preacher always has this dilemma you know, uh, we, we want to uh, sufficiently give time to the death. Uh, and, and burial of, of Christ, and we want to give sufficient time to the resurrection of Christ, and, and somehow it's all supposed to magically happen on one weekend of the year, and, and we know that it doesn't quite work that way, and I like us to take more time in, in, in examining some of these critical moments, and so where we are this morning is, is just um, 
just before his arrest. We are very close. And so the cross was quite near. Uh, but it is significant that all four Gospels give a huge amount of volume, of space, to telling us about these last hours. And, and it is uh, extremely important for us to, to examine that. And I, I think that's a, a, an, it's there for a reason. So the cross was near, but we also see that Jesus was experiencing intense emotion within his own heart, within his own life, and then, of course, opposition from the outside. And so this was an intense moment, and we see that in his own heart here in the garden, and then the opposition, um, which has already been building for a long time, kind of uh, reaches its final point in, in a very short amount of time as well. What is the goal of our time together this morning? Well, there would be a number of things, and, and um, I, I would be mindful of what I'm going to share with you here, but also the Lord may be doing something unique in your own heart that is related to what we're talking about or, or what have you. And so there may be multiple things that we're dealing with here. But one of the things we want to do in this time is to understand just some of what Jesus suffered for us. And sometimes we might do this by, by looking at, uh, at the actual crucifixion as he was nailed to the cross and, and the things that took place right there. But leading up to that, there was an awful lot of uh, suffering that was taking place as well. And so we will uh, examine that a little bit more this morning. And then uh, also, th there's a reason why we want to look at that suffering. It's in order that we may live for him, uh, that we may understand what he went through so that we can live for him. And there's a great passage of scripture that helps bring this out. And so I'm just going to read this for you from 1 Peter chapter 2. A uh, passage you're probably familiar with. For, for to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who ju judges justly. And then I've underlined this part. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. So why did Christ experience the tremendous amount of suffering and death uh, that he faced? Why, why did he go through that? Well, he did that. He, he was bearing our sins. He was our sin bearer. And he died for us that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, that we could have new life in him, that we could live for his purposes, for his honor, for his glory. That is, is what he has done for us. And so our desire is uh, to see and observe what he went through to bring us life. He died that we might live. And that is so encouraging for us. Uh, on this side of the cross, we understand that and are thankful for that. So let's look at some things then this morning. Uh, so let's begin by reading uh, from Luke 22, beginning at verse 39. And for the moment, I will stop at verse 46. So, and he came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. 
And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Now just, uh, there's more that we'll get to in a moment, but let's just uh, pause there. And uh, let's look actually to one of the other passages of Scripture. The neat thing about the Gospels is that we do have parallel accounts of many of the events that took place. And so I'm going to invite you to turn also to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26, as we read just a few verses, uh, beginning at verse 36, going to 39 here. And again, we're, we're, we're not catching all of the details, uh, but we are just noticing some things. And I would encourage you to specifically think about um, aspects of, of the suffering of our Savior. So Matthew 26, beginning at verse 36, Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. All right, I'm just going to go that far in that particular passage. But we see uh, the same events, but specifically words that are used to describe it. He's sorrowful, he's troubled, he's very sorrowful. One other passage that I think is significant for us in this moment is Isaiah chapter 53. And uh, you are quite familiar with a number of those verses. I'm just going to touch on a few verses from Isaiah 53, which really deals with this, the the whole chapter really deals with with the suffering servant. That is who who he is uh, in this particular moment. But I'm just going to catch a a few spots, beginning at verse 3. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Jumping to verse 4, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. So that's interesting. He uses the same words. He's one who who knows sorrow and grief and, and he carries our sorrow and grief. That'll preach, but another day. Let's keep moving. Uh, Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. So there's an awful lot of similar themes from the verses we've already looked at to what we're finding here in Isaiah 53. Now let me jump down to verse 10 for a moment. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him, okay? We're going to be talking about the will of the Father in a few moments. It was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. Anguish of his soul. Let's go back to our passage in Luke. So all of those verses, then, they speak of one who is truly suffering. And again, we, we hold that intention with the one who has overcome the world. He has 
truly been victorious over sin, hell, and death. And we celebrate the victory that is ours in Christ. But we don't want to rush there. This morning we want to park a little bit in some of the agonizing places. So when we see the suffering of our Savior, uh, some of the things that we see are his agony. And the word that is used to describe that is the same word that is used of an athlete before uh, some kind of a competition or a contest. And some of you have uh, been in competitive uh, events and and felt that very thing Um, but it probably translates into uh, a lot of other things sometimes we might feel that way when we have to get up and speak in front of a crowd or something like that or before a big test there's this turmoil sometimes we describe it physically as our our stomach is churning or we feel like we're going to throw up or we we talk about those kinds of things but but there is very much a, a physical side to this kind of agon, agonizing, anxious sort of um, unsettledness. There is that going on in our Savior. Now, we've already looked at a passage that told us that, that he committed no sin. And so we do not have a Savior here who is... Um, so tied up in knots that he is committing sin against God. This is not what is going on. But he is also, he is fully human. And so there is a sense of of agonizing, a, a trouble, a sorrow, exactly the same words that are used in the passage to describe how he's feeling. And so if, uh, if we think of Jesus at all being uh, very casual and laid back about this, that, that's not what was going on. Uh, there was some agony that he was experiencing. We talked last week about these next couple of things, so I won't spend too long here, but uh, you will notice some similarities between what we looked at last week with the transfiguration of Christ and how they spoke of, as, as Moses and Elijah were with Jesus, they, they spoke of his departure and, and we got a glimpse there of some, some very significant things. Well, what we see here then is again uh, this, this cup as Jesus goes and prays. He prays that the cup would be taken from him, that he would not have to go through it. But he, he qualifies that. He's, he's not at all saying, I'm going to go ahead and get out of this thing. He, he qualifies it by saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. And so in everything that he's doing, Jesus is being obedient to the will of the Father. And it's not like he's saying, Lord, I'm not going to do your will, because he uses that, uh, he uses those specific words to help us understand this. But even at the beginning of the, the way the prayer is worded here, Father, if you are willing, So he is already submitting to the Father, even as he asks for this cup to be removed. This cup is the cup of God's wrath, is the cup of him going to the cross and carrying upon himself uh, the, the wrath of Almighty God, the punishment for sin. He, as our sin bearer, is taking all of what we deserve upon himself, experiencing that. And so in this prayer, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, he says. If there's another way, let's go another way. However, he says, not my will, but yours be done. 
This, this prayer has been described as the greatest prayer ever prayed. The moment when our will is laid down and the will of God is that which is picked up. Uh, I trust that this prayer is a part of your life and that you can take the example of Jesus and pray in that way. Lord, I'm struggling with this. But it's not my will that's important, it's yours. And so I want to be obedient to you. We'll touch on that again in a moment. So we have the wrath of God as, uh, as Jesus is experiencing uh, what he's about to face. He, he, in his mind's eye at this moment, knows what lies ahead of him. And he just lays his soul bare as he heads toward the cross. So the next point then is that he's, he, he, there is a sense of aloneness here. And, and again, we referenced this uh, last time. But the, something about those disciples. I don't know if they just stayed up too late at night or they, they needed to get a better rest. But no, they're, they're struggling again with sleep here. And, and there is this, uh, this sense of aloneness that Jesus feels in this moment. He, he's taken the disciples with him and he calls them to pray. In verse 40, it's, it's the idea that he says, pray that you may not enter into temptation. Um, in other words, there's a, a, an incredible moment that lies before us and Jesus can speak about this himself, the moment that lies before him, the cross, but he can also speak of the moment that's going to lie before the disciples, that in just a short period of time, uh, they're going to have an opportunity to stand up for the Lord, to speak uh, for, about him, and to acknowledge him. But there may be a temptation to deny him, and of course we know what happened. And so there's a time before that big moment where we pray that God would strengthen us for what lies ahead. And Jesus is calling the disciples to be involved in that. Pray that you would not enter into temptation, that, that you would stand strong in, in what lies ahead. Pray for that. And uh, you can even go back earlier in the chapter to verse 31, Look at what verse 31 of Luke 22 says. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you. I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, so Jesus is praying that, that he would not fall, but knowing that he will fall. That's pretty cool. When you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you, both to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny me three times, deny three times that you know me. And so the disciples are invited to join in in this effort to pray for Jesus along with him because that's clearly what they could see the intensity in, in his life. They were invited to pray for themselves yeah, because there are going to be some tough things that lie, lie ahead. But what happens? Well, Jesus goes off to pray, and when he comes back, he has found them sleeping. They're, they're exhausted. Now, I don't want to be too hard on them. You and I might have done the same thing. But do we realize that the weight of this world and the things of this life, if, if, we have, if we wrap all of our energy up in the things of this life, we do not have the energy that is needed for the truly important things. And so Jesus does feel a sense of aloneness here 
as those that he has called to join him in this prayer movement are, are not with him. Uh, they are sleeping. And, and there is something to that. Now we, we see the strength of the Lord here. And this is kind of a, um, uh, an interlude maybe, is, uh, if I use a, a word that I don't use very often, but it's the idea of, of there's something kind of in, be- in between the two things that we're uh, really focusing on this morning. We want to we wanna see what he suffered. We want to understand how that motivates us to live for him. But in the middle of this, we, we see the strength of the Lord uh, that, it, that comes to him. And, and that is uh, in the prayer when he says, not my will, but yours be done. That is a significant moment of strength that we see in our Savior. He, uh, as much as he's wrestling and struggling, he remains within the Father's will, and that is his primary concern. And so you will be at your strongest when you may feel at your weakest if you can pray in this way. Lord, not, not my will, but yours be done. We, we may feel extremely weak, but that is one of the strongest things that you and I can do is to submit to the Father's will in that moment. We also see a kind of a unique thing that's pointed out here that, that there is a, an angel that comes and ministers to him. And uh, that... Is, is a sign of God caring for his own. Verse 43 points that out. It appeared to him an angel from heaven strengthening him. So God, as alone as Jesus might feel in this moment, the disciples, they're, they're doing their own thing. He's agonizing over it, and yet God meets him in that moment. This is very similar to what we saw last week with the transfiguration. There's, there's Jesus in that moment, and then we've got Moses and Elijah who show up talk, talking to him about his departure, about the cross that would come. And, and that was a part of God, uh, the Father, truly, and then the voice that the Father speaks as well, truly ministering and strengthening the Son. And we have something similar here. And so just a reminder, God does not leave us. He does not forsake us. And we see this in our Savior as he is ministered to by a messenger of the Father. But then we we also see his example. And we observe that uh, what is in Scripture is, is for our learning to help us know how to uh, handle things that come up in our lives as well. And so this is very clear. Now, please do not think that, that all that we can learn from Jesus is by his example, okay? That's sort of what some... Uh, would do when when we look at at these events or any events in the life of Christ, they would say, well, we we just learn from his example and then we become better people as we see that. That's not the gospel message. The gospel message is that Jesus went to the cross and, and died in order that we might have life. He didn't just come to earth to set a good example, right? So don't get that mixed up and think that this is the ultimate reason that he came was to set a good example for us. That's, that's not true. But we can learn from his example. As a matter of fact, script, Scripture commands us to walk in his steps, and the passage we started off with told us that. And so we do learn from his example, and I trust there will be some things that we share quickly in a moment here that, uh, that you will be encouraged by. Number one, it's good for us to develop the habit of prayer in your life. You, you, you don't want to miss that where he went to, he came out and went as, as was his custom to the Mount of Olives. And, and the idea is that we often see Jesus at different points getting away from the crowds in order to pray. 
And so there's a good point of example here for you and I that we would develop the habit of prayer in our own lives. That we would take time away in order to commune with the Father. At 10, uh, this past Thursday night, at 10.55 p.m., I chuckled to myself. Why did I chuckle, you might ask? I heard you asking, didn't I? Well, because this week I seem to have a particularly difficult time putting this message together that you're hearing right now. Now, that's not totally uncommon for me. I often struggle with what I'm going to say or things of that nature. But this week just seemed to be a little bit different in that um, uh, lots of time with the, with the Bible open, lots of time trying to figure out how to say what, what, what's on my heart and trying to figure out, trying to match what, what God's word is saying, make that what is on my heart part of that process, but wrestling and struggling to such a degree that, that I, I, I said to Kelly and I said to uh, someone else that I'm just having a hard time putting this together, and I, I can't quite figure it out. And um, as I was working on it then uh, Thursday night, and as the clock got around to that 10.55 mark, it's like, it's like, and I want to be careful, it's I did not hear an audible voice, but the Holy Spirit was saying to my heart, you expect to share a sermon about the agony that Jesus went through without going through a little bit of your own agony and preparation? And I chuckled. Thank you, Lord. I get it now. And so in that moment, there was a moment of surrender. And... Um, and, and, and that is truly what it is about. You know, do we think that we're going to go through things in life without agony, without the hardness of it? No, it's, it's going to be hard. And so all the more reason to develop this habit of prayer so that we will be before the Lord, that we will be uh, honest and open before him. but qualifying every prayer with, Lord, it's not about me. It's not my will that needs to happen here. It's your will. If we can develop that habit, we will be in a good place. And that goes right into this next one. It's all part of the same. So when you have the habit of prayer, then you, you have to get to that place of surrender in that. It doesn't work. You know, if, if prayer is just about us getting God to do what we want, then we've missed it. It is about this surrender. And then it is also about something significant. As we look at the example of Jesus, um, we see the way he conducts himself is helpful for us. So beginning at verse 47, we're going to read 47 now to 53. And just a, a couple of comments, and then we're wrapping it up. Verse 47. While he was still speaking, there came a crowd, and the man called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He drew near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? And just a comment here that, you know, this again is part of the loneliness that Jesus experienced uh, as uh, he was betrayed by one of his own that way. And when those who were around him saw what would follow, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. That was, it was Peter, by the way, it was Peter. But Jesus said, no more of this. And he touched uh, his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests and officers of the temple and elders who had come out against him, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs when I was with you day and night in the temple? 
you did not lay hands on me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. So in those verses, we, we see that there, is, uh, there, there was an effort that, that rose up to repay evil with evil here. And Peter's thinking, if you guys are going to come after Jesus this way, then, then you're going to have to deal with me, and I've got some things I want to do. And so he struck out, but Jesus made it clear that this is not the way we do this. And he went on then, you know, Jesus went on to experience many other physical um, attacks upon him, Self and he did not revile, and we spoke about that, or we read that earlier from the passages, Isaiah and and First um, Peter as well, and so it is uh, uh, a good reminder that we can walk in the steps of our Savior, and not repay evil with evil, but instead trust ourselves to the one who judges justly. Last thought. James chapter 5 says, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. So we want to look at the suffering that Jesus went through, and we've only looked at a few small things. He, he suffered greatly. But we want to learn from that experience. We understand the gospel message and, and why that suffering was necessary for one who knew no sin but became sin for us. But then we can also learn how to handle the suffering that we face. And some of you right now as we've been talking and I've used that word suffering an awful lot because the scripture uses that word an awful lot in what we've looked at today. But there are some of you that may be suffering in various ways physically in your own body, emotionally in your mind and in your heart, relationally with other people. There may be many ways that you are suffering and scripture is pretty clear about what we are to do. We are to pray and, and to seek the Lord in those moments and to allow that suffering to be used for his purposes, for his honor, for his glory. And so could we do that as we close our time together this morning? Let's pray. And uh, I want you to think in your own heart about what it is that you are uh, suffering through right now and, and something that weighs heavy on your heart, uh, maybe a wrong that's been done to you, maybe a uh, something that you know you have done and you are suffering as a result of that. There are many ways that you could go with this, but in that moment of quietness right now, let's pray in your own heart and then I will lead us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending Jesus to be our Savior. We, uh, we think of the agony of the cross, and at the same time we rejoice in that cross. And Lord, I pray that we would be people who, when we suffer, that we take it to you that we pour out our heart before you as Jesus has done, but that we submit ourselves to your will as Jesus has done, and that we walk in that. Lord, we ask for your strengthening of us as we face various trials and tribulations and difficulties and circumstances and we don't even pray that those things would necessarily be answered the way that we are praying, except that we submit it all to your will. 
because you know what is best. And we ask for that. In Jesus' name, amen.